Okay guys, so this is the last video that I have on Chapter 9's coverage of elimination. Now that we've learned about substitution reactions from Chapter 8 and elimination reactions from Chapter 9, we can combine that knowledge and use it to do synthesis. Here are a few reactions that I want you guys to learn in this genre. In the Williamson ether synthesis reaction, you can react an alkoxide, that is an alcohol that's been deprotonated to give you a negatively charged oxygen, with an alkyl halide. What occurs is this negatively charged oxygen comes and attacks the carbon that's bound to a leaving group, in this case a bromine, kicks off the bromide SN2 style to form this type of product, which is an ether. These R groups can be the same if you choose, or they could actually be different, giving you an asymmetric ether. Here are two different means of doing that. In one, you can take your alcohol, treat it with sodium metal, and it will form an alkoxide, that is, a deprotonated alcohol, which has a negative charge on the oxygen. And conversely, you can treat your alcohol with a strong base, like sodium hydride, to achieve the same means. Once you have these negatively charged oxygens, you can dump in an alkyl halide, such as an alkyl bromide shown here, to generate your final product ether, the Williamson ether synthesis. Now if you're in a circumstance where you want to synthesize an alkene through an elimination process, there are two different ways we've learned of doing it. One is by an E1 mechanism, and another is by an E2 mechanism. Now one nuance that's important for you guys to know is this. Generally speaking, E2 conditions are preferred, and the reason is because E1 conditions can frequently lead to rearrangements or competitive substitution reactions. If, for example, I have this starting material, 2-bromo-2-methylbutane, and I react it under SN1-E1 conditions, I will, of course, get the major elimination product, but I can also see substitution occurring via an SN1 mechanism. If, in contrast, I treat them under SN2E2 conditions, because this is a leaving group stuck to a tertiary carbon, no SN2 products will ensue. The reason is because a strong nucleophile cannot attack a tertiary carbon. It's flanked by three carbons all around it, making it too encroached to be able to get a nucleophile in there. Instead, it will just do an elimination, giving me solely the target alkene product that I want. I will, of course, get this internal more substituted alkene as my major product by Zaitsev's rule. There's another type of elimination reaction that I like to call the double E2 reaction, although I'm not sure our book actually gives it that name. Here's what we can do. If we've got a molecule like this where I've got two leaving groups stuck on a carbon, I can do an elimination twice. It requires a strong base such as NaNH2, which is also called sodamid. What occurs is Molecule of NH2 minus strips a proton here at the carbon next door, pumps the electrons down, and kicks off the bromide to give me this intermediate. A second molecule of NH2 minus can then do the same thing again to give me an alkyne. So I can do a double E2 reaction to take a starting material that has two leaving groups, such as a gem dibromide shown here, and do two tandem elimination reactions to get and alkyne. Now in contrast, I can do the same thing with a molecule that has two leaving groups on carbons next door to each other. This is a vicinal dichloride. Using the exact same conditions, the first molecule of NH2- will grab a hydrogen here, pump the electrons down, and kick off a chloride leaving group to give me this intermediate. And then the second molecule will do the same thing just on the carbon to the left, giving me my final product alkyne. Let's go on <laughs> with a couple of problems. I want you to design syntheses of the following products from the given starting materials. I'll give you a hint. They are going to involve substitution or elimination reactions. Now, as I am going to show you the answers to these questions, if you want to, you can pause the video now and attempt to do them on your own before moving on. Here's the answer to the first one. I'm attempting to convert this alkene into this molecule that has a cyanide appended at this position. How in the world can I do that? Well, you guys might recognize that if I treat this alkene with HBr, electrons come out, form a bond with the hydrogen, giving me a carbocation intermediate, and then the bromide comes and forms a carbon there, giving me this cyclopentyl bromide. I can now do an SN2 by treating this cyclopentyl bromide with sodium cyanide. 
Cyanide is a strong nucleophile. It comes in here, SN2 style, kicks off the bromide, and gives me my final target. In this case, I've got a tertiary bromide that I'm wanting to convert into a racemic mixture of this alcohol. How in the world can I do that? There may be a couple of different ways. But one that you'll recognize is this. If I treat this bromide with a strong base, such as sodium tert butoxide, I can do an E2 elimination in which the hydrogen here at this position adjacent is grabbed and the electrons are thrust down to kick off the bromide in one fell swoop, giving me this intermediate. With this intermediate, I can now treat it with hydroboration oxidation conditions to put the OH at the anti-Markovnikov position. You'll recognize that if I treated this with water and acid, the proton would place itself at this position and my OH would end up at the more substituted tertiary carbon. To get the OH at the less substituted position, the anti-Markovnikov product, I use hydroboration oxidation conditions shown here. Here's some more examples. Show me how to synthesize the given products from the given starting materials. Once again, as I'm going to show you the answers, you're welcome to pause the video here and attempt to do them on your own first. My hint, of course, is that these will involve substitution and or elimination conditions. In this first example, I want to convert this butyl bromide into this butyl ketone in which there's a carbon-oxygen double bond right here in the middle. For the sake of clarity, I'm actually going to number each of the carbons in this butyl bromide here, and then I'm going to treat it with a strong base. My favorite is, of course, sodium terp butoxide because it will give me, in all likelihood, exclusive E2 elimination to form this product. Now just so that you can recognize this alkene product is indeed what you form, I'm numbering the carbons 1, 2, 3, and 4. This is of course formed by grabbing the hydrogen at carbon 2, pumping the electrons down to form a carbon-carbon double bond between 1 and 2 and kicking off the bromide in one fell swoop, E2 style. At this point, we can now take this molecule and treat it with bromine and a non-water solvent to generate a vicinal dibromide in which these two bromines are neighbors to each other. Why in the world would I want to do that? Well, the reason is because under the conditions I showed you in an earlier slide today, you can treat this with sodamid or NaNH2 and have this negatively charged NH2 do a double E2 elimination to form an alkyne. Why in the world would I want to form an alkyne? Well, as we learned in our earlier chapter on alkyne chemistry, if I treat an alkyne under these conditions, acid, water, and mercury sulfate, it places an OH at the internal carbon. I still retain a double bond, thus the intermediate formed is an enol. The enol instantly tautomerizes to form this ketone shown here. If you don't believe me, go back and review the re reactions that I covered in our earlier chapter on alkynes. Here's our final problem. I want to convert this molecule, which has both an alkene and a leaving group, this bromide, in one single molecule into this target product. How in the world would I go about doing that? Well, for the sake of clarity, I'm going to number all of my carbon atoms in our starting material, as shown here. You'll note that if I treat this starting material with water and acid, I'm going to place an OH at the internal position, carbon-4, giving me the Markovnikov alcohol. I've redrawn this molecule to look kind of closer to our final product so that you can see this. You'll note that this first reaction once again places an OH at carbon-4, as I've drawn here. The bromine that's attached to carbon-1 remains in my product. The reason I've redrawn this molecule here is so that you can see clearly that when I treat it with either sodium metal or sodium hydride, it removes this hydrogen, replaces it with a negative charge, and then the O- can do an internal SN2 on this carbon, kicking off the bromide in one fell swoop SN2 style, thereby giving me this final product. So that's the end of these wonderful synthesis examples. If you want to do more practice examples, I recommend looking at some of the examples in our text, or you can look some up on the internet. I'll be giving you, my students in class, some more problems to do on our problem set. This is the end of our video and the end of our Chapter 9 coverage of elimination chemistry. I hope that it's been fun for you, and I hope you have an enjoyable rest of your day. Until next time, I'll see you later.